Welcome to the Quiet Warrior Show, where we help top leaders find their pathway to incredible success and a lifetime of happiness. Here is your host, Tom Dutta, the Quiet Warrior. All right, everybody, welcome to the Quiet Warrior Show. This is Tom Dutta, like Butta. I'm excited. Uh, I'm going to bring him out of the green room in just a minute my guest and you're in for a treat but first of all where are we today well we're live streaming we're live across linkedin facebook youtube and twitter depending on what feed you're on give us a subscribe if you're on youtube that way you'll get the production this is live taping it's next generation of of radio everybody it's like peeking into the studio as we're taping live you'll get to see all the fun and the and any bloopers as well also you'll be able to chat in the chat box depending on what uh, feed you're on and we'll be able to communicate uh, back and forth by putting your comments on the screen and let me tell you a little bit about my guest he's in the green room we'll bring him out in a minute His name is chester l richards now he's an aerospace engineer retired an inventor an adventurer author storyteller and a romantic and boy i just finished reading his book and it is it's ever a, a, a story to be heard the philosophy developed by chester richards aerospace engineer venture and inventor he had uh, 19 patents he, he indeed caused him to view all that comes his way as an adventure today's about an adventure everyone even a visit to the hospital <laughs> The attitude took shape early in his life. He'll talk a lot about that. And, well, the, the book we're going to show when we bring him on, but there's something about Star Trek and a potato in there. And as I got into that book, I was mesmerized by that whole story. A little bit of a surprise. So let's bring him out of the green room now and welcome him to the show. Chester Richards, welcome. Thank you so much. All I'm right. very pleased to be here. I uh, love your hat, man. We're, tell, what kind of hat is that? Uh, I don't know. I picked it up in a shop and I said, I need a straw hat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, That's awesome. You know. And uh, where's home Where's home for you? Where are you living? I live in Thousand Oaks in California. Uh, that's just north of uh, Los Angeles between LA and, and Santa Barbara. Fantastic. And uh, the, the power of the, the connection, I'm up here in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, Actually, uh, growing up, my dad's uh, had my aunt. They were farmers out in Yuba City. I used to spend a lot of time down there. Listen, uh, I want you to start by holding up this book that you've written. Let's oh, put sure. you. Let, I'm going to full screen you, Chester. So let's just get that okay. on the screen and read out the title to us. Uh, From the Potato to Star Trek and Beyond: Memoirs of a Rocket Scientist. Okay. I'm supposed to be a rocket scientist, so they put that in there too. <laughs> I, I love it, everybody. Now, I, I, you're going to hear about the book in just a bit, but uh, you want to get that book, you want to read it. And I highly recommend the way we get authors' work known is to post a review if, you, if you've read this work. And uh, we'll be talking about my review a little later in the show. I want to put something on the screen here for a minute that we can both look at. Uh, today's a bit of storytelling. There's a picture on the screen there. What, what, tell us a bit about that. That's out of the book. Okay. The guy with the hat, is uh, his name is, is Sam Street. Yeah. And the way he got that name is he was wandering down the street in, in Flagstaff one day, and he saw a street sign saying Sam Street. And he thought that was a really cool name. So he went to the, to the, uh, uh, the courthouse, and he changed his name to Sam Street. <laughs> <laughs> And what's this, That'll give what, you a sense of the kind of character this guy was, <laughs> but he was really an amazing character. Uh, yeah. He was trip leader on a, on my first Grand Canyon uh, river cruise. Wow. And, um, quite an ex exciting experience that was. There is a story in the book about Sam, and yeah. so you get a sense of his personality a little bit. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I'm just going to bring us back together again here, and then I might, uh, I'm going to put something else up. One of the things I loved about the book was its storytelling. And not just storytelling, but we have these black and white photos which appear throughout the book. There's photo credits. Uh, one of the things I dream of is having authors on the show, Chester, who can uh, do some reading. So I'm going to surprise you here. We're going to. I love my Kindle, so I've read your book as I mentioned, cover to cover. I'm going to put something else on the screen here. All right, that is out of the uh, the book itself. This is the Kindle version. Now I highlighted something there, so I would love it if you would just 
read us that, that paragraph and then we'll talk oh, about yeah. it. Okay, well, you need an actor to do this properly, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try. I made a decision I've never regretted, and that's to fill my life with adventure. Well, easier said than done. After all, I needed to earn a living. Luckily, there would be vacations in my future, and these would provide provide me with the time and resources to dive into a series of hazardous, hair-raising odysseys. On those occasions, I did write, keeping a daily journal. Moreover, Bob's wisdom changed my perspective about ordinary things. Well, wow. now I want to just ask you, riff on that and get into that a bit. Uh, uh, you know, who it tells who a Bob was, and then this whole reason for writing the book. It's it's a memoir, but you know, it's an adventure. Why why did you write it? <laughs> well, I, I wrote it as a uh, to recover from a tragedy because my wife died, uh, literally dropped dead in front of me. And well, the heart stopped in front of me. She formally passed away the next day. Oh my. But uh, that was, I was just absolutely devastated. Anybody who's been through that experience, I don't have to say what, what that's involved. Yeah. If you've not been through it, you don't, you don't have a clue. So um, uh, in trying to recover from that, I found that putting words on down on paper, in this particular case, a computer screen, it yeah. just, it helped. And, and I just started writing some of the stories that uh, my wife, Sarah, had been familiar with. And I just started thinking of those as, well, I'm writing a letter to her, you know, and I'm recording these stories and she, you know, wherever she is, she can enjoy these stories in the written form. So uh, I just did one after another. And after a while, you just, you know, it helped me recover. I actually got my balance back. And of course, my life was changed yeah. completely as a result of that. Well, I'm just going to let you catch your breath there. First of all, uh, proud of you for uh, for writing and sharing that. I know, I know, Chester, that each time we have to share a painful moment, we relive it. And I can tell by, you know, just uh, body language and the emotion but uh, what an amazing thing. I want to put back up this picture show and just show you the uh, the beautiful, that's Sarah, right? That's Sarah, field. yeah. She's <laughs> in the weeds. <laughs> uh, genuine, you know, we put those weeds, she thought these would be really nice as decorations in the house. So we put them in the car and of course they all fell apart. <laughs> <laughs> had to, where had where, where is that? Leading the car out. That's at the foot of... Um, uh, not Zion, but um, uh, one of the uh, canyons in um, Utah. Yeah. And um, there was just this, you know, it was just growing there. And uh, she said, stop. She says, I want to collect some of those. Well, we learned that you don't necessarily collect everything that comes your way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I want to put a quote up on the screen and just read it out loud so we can capture it in the production. I'll just read out loud there to you. When I read read that story in the book, it hit me in the solar plexus. But the recovery part is something I've is something I've experienced. The power of writing really healing. Uh, I just want to talk about that because people have losses, Chester, in their lives, and they process things differently. You had never written a book before. I understand this was a memoir. I think you've done some blog writing, and just. Help me understand how many years ago did you lose Sarah? And um, then, yeah, it was about, I think it was 16 years ago now. So, you know, I obviously I've rebuilt my life completely yeah. in, in a new way. So. And, and so everybody, I just want to say, and I don't want to st spoil the, the book, hold it up again there, Chester, so we can sure. see it. We're today with the author of the potato, uh, from the potato to Star Trek and beyond. And uh, thank you, Chester. But as I opened the book, and it was unusual for me, that story hit me right up front. And it was, uh, it really feel the emotion. And as you just heard Chester, everybody describe how his uh, his wonderful Sarah passed uh, in front of him. Uh, it, 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 you know, for millions of people out there, uh, uh, Chester, I just want to tell you that it's going to bring connection and healing uh, to see how you've worked your way through that. I also want to honor Sarah in that. How many years were you guys together? Well, we were together for 20 years. Wow. And uh, quite extraordinary years. She was an amazing individual. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, we go back to the other parts in the book. Tell me why you wrote it as a storytelling book, and then we'll get into maybe one of the first ones, which was about Star Trek. 
Yeah, well, I, I got into it simply because uh, I had the habit when, when I was on my adventures out in the wilderness, I kept a journal uh, most of the time. Yeah, And uh, that was an interesting thing to do because I'd write down the day's events as a little one day story. And uh, I often had the opportunity to read the stories around the campfire. Uh, so I had the people who were there and watched these events actually act as my critics. You know, you better do it right <laughs> and you better be entertaining or they're just going to shove you aside, you know. So I got in the habit of writing these little, little stories and, um, you, you know, it's a skill you develop. Um, and so when I started writing my memoirs, I just started writing them as stories, yeah. sp specific episodes that I thought were interesting episodes, you know. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I'm going to bring back on the screen here the, uh, I'll just put it back there, if I can just put us with it. For those who are going to be listening to the future podcast, you won't see these images, but you got to get the book. They're there. We'll, uh, we'll just move on a bit in the, in the presentation to a, another picture here. Where is this one? All right. This is in Africa, in Ethiopia, on what's called the Awash River. Okay. Um, those that are into anthropology and archaeology, archaeology um, will be familiar with this area. This is where uh, the hominid Lucy was discovered. It was downstream from these uh, waterfalls some distance. And we did a, a warm-up river trip on this river, just a, a two-day trip uh, to get the feel of, of the area and just have some fun uh, before going down our main expedition. Now, have you always liked the outdoors? Because I saw I, many of the adventures take place in the in the outdoors in spectacular places like this. <laughs> All right. Um, basically, what we were involved with on this expedition was to go down the Omo River, which is a, a very large river in the, yeah. that, that cuts through central uh, Ethiopia. And it had only been run once. So we were, the, as far as I know, we were the second people to go down through this area. But because of the tsetse flies in the area, there weren't any people. It was just total wilderness. Nothing but us and wild animals and bugs <laughs> <laughs> for a month. Uh, I remember reading that, and there was a, I think there was a comment in there about malaria or, or, or the, the, the part about the bugs. And I just want to honor you again. Every time a writer like you writes a book and someone reads it, we connect through threads in our stories. That's the whole narrative of my show is the hero's journey. I was born in, in England, Chester, and, and immigrated from there. But we traveled through M Malaysia and Singapore before coming here when I was six. And I had I had malaria at a, a, a very young age. I think my temperature was 103.5. And my parents said, I, you know, I was lucky I survived. And then I'm reading your book and I learned about this uh, event you had with your own health and your mom somehow miraculously was able to save your life. Tell us about that. Uh, yeah, I was a newborn baby and um, we, my dad was stationed at, at Fort Benning in, in uh, Georgia yeah. and we were living in the nearby town of Columbus. And uh, my mom was a public health nurse uh, working for the health department down there. And I guess she had uh, some connections with the army because she was able to wangle in early 1942 uh, a dose of penicillin. Um, and this was still a top secret um, uh, military technology at the time. Um, how she got the dose, I have no idea. It, it was extraordinary because it had to be approved in Washington and it had to be flown down from um, one of the northern states, Indiana or Illinois, uh, to Georgia. And it all had to be done within a day in order to save my life. I had bronchial pneumonia at the time. Oh, uh, There's one other person in 1942 who got a dose and that, that I know of in the literature. Just So we were, as far as I know, we were the only two people who got doses of penicillin uh, during that, that early, uh, very early period in, in the history of the, of the uh, antibiotic. That that's a that's amazing, and everyone, when you uh, read the the book here, we're with uh, Chester Richards, the author of this book. You you get to that chapter, and there's a whole lot more depth in it. I know we don't have all the details on a radio show, but I was blown away when uh, when it, when I read that there was only th maybe th I think something like thirty uh, doses for 
period. Yeah, and, for, until the end of 1942, they think there were only 30 doses oh. had, that had been produced at that point. So, <laughs> did you realize I you? One, I got one of the early doses. So. Did you realize later in life how lucky you were when you when you learned that? <laughs> well, my mom told me the, a little bit of the story. She never told me about how she got the the drug, but she did tell me that she got the drug. Wow! And it saved my life. Um, but you know, obviously, I was an experiment. <laughs> and she was willing to risk that experiment. She was willing to risk uh, in order to try and save my life because I would have died otherwise. There's no question about that. That's amazing. Wow. I just am uh, honored that I get to speak to you. What, a, what an incredible story and worth reading. Let's just jump ahead then to your mom and dad because what I, what I loved about the book, and I've put this in my review for you, uh, again, we'll surprise you in a bit with that, that I was looking at these stories and I was one of the things I, I think you did well is when you write a story and the reader, Chester, can jump into the story and be in the journey. And uh, part of me was I had this uh, unquenched thirst for, okay, what, what, who's this man? I want to know more about his his early years and, and, and the why and his character and the child. And then you delivered big time. Uh, I won't spoil spoil the narrative, but later in the book, several of the chapters really set set me on fire. And one of them was about your parents. Tell us the, the name of your parents, and I think they were together for like sixty years. Uh, yeah, m well, my dad was obviously I'm a junior. My dad was also Chester L. Richards, yeah. And um, uh, my mom, uh, Catherine Richards, K. Richards, uh, her parents were born in Sicily. So she is a first generation American, Sicilian American. And uh, my dad's family uh, came over Mayflower days into the country a few years after the Mayflower was here. And they were pioneers all the way across the country. Um, there is a story in there about my great uncle Chet and his description of, of our great grandparents yeah. um, coming across uh, on the Oregon Trail in a wagon train. And, wow. <laughs> uh, you know, so so I so we have a situation where we've got a in effect a Connecticut Yankee getting together with um, a Sicilian. And that's an interesting combination. Describe <laughs> how that's done and, and, you know, that how that happened in this in the uh, stories as well. Yeah, it's uh, it's it made me smile because I'm married to uh, Romanelli. My wife was born just outside of Rome. And of course, I, my roots are Fiji and my grandparents from India, and here I'm a yeah. Canadian. But when I first walked up the stairs to my my in-laws' home here, first of all, Chester, I love the culture. I'm thinking there's 50 people in the room. I get in that room, there's like six. And yeah. there's the dummy johns, the wine, the pasta, the sausages. And they're, they're, uh, their mom thought I was Sicilian because I have very dark complexion, yeah. full head of hair. But uh, wonderful culture. I learned a lot about your parents. I just want to say this because my lifeline... Uh, as you get to know me, was different. I was virtually homeless at age 12. My dad was a very bad alcoholic and quite a violent man that took the brunt of that. And so I didn't really see the love and nurturing. And today I do a lot of learning about brain science. And they say that if you have at least one nurturing parent, you know, the way our brain develops in the early years to perceive the world, to manage stress, uh, it works out much better. I think it's a gift that you've got, you had two parents really who are just, from what I read, kind and nurturing. And I want you to talk about your dad for a moment, uh, his, his profession, and then connect us into this potato thing. <laughs> well, we have to be careful about the potato. My, uh, my uh, uh, um, publisher says we got to have a hook in the book so i'm not supposed to talk too much about the potato oh okay well we'll we'll, we'll say we'll we'll tease we'll, we'll tease people I about the, potato. This, the as, <laughs> as you since you've read the story you know what a hair raising experience that <laughs> was. well I why do don't we the, we'll, i do have the scars from that all the way to you know i okay. still have the scars on my arm from from that experience that's amazing well hang on let me jump in here for a minute to help out help out the the mystique so we won't steal the the story align on that everyone but i gotta tell you you have to get this book you gotta read it to understand what the heck that potato thing is because i i had to read it over and over again it's a powerful metaphor 
that really weaves a thread through, I think, everybody's life. We all have that somewhere. But your dad was, a, pardon me if I get this wrong, I was fascinated. Be, again, another thread connecting us. I've never met you. I grew up with, uh, again, because I was not quite in a home that was uh, nurturing, I had a best friend named Cliff. We called him Cliffy. And Cliff and I would play street hockey. And I think the only reason Cliff liked me is because he would cheat off my paper in school. He'd rather... <laughs> And uh, we'd go over at his father's house, and I really hung out there. And in the garage, there were those old uh, pinball machines and the big stacks of dad's pop, you know, soda. And that's where we were. And I met his dad, and he was from Quebec uh, and was a, a, ran a printing press, or he had his print, printing business. And so I started learning about that. And then when I read your story about your dad's profession, tell us about that, because this apparently came down the line through the story from his life uh, into your life? Well, I think it's, it starts with uh, my grandfather. And um, my grandfather was one of those very rare people who around 1900 actually got a bachelor's degree from the university. Yep. And, and he uh, started a print shop in Seattle, Washington, in the Green Lake district of mm. Seattle. Yeah. And, um, and my dad grew up in that environment in a print shop, um, and of course they had really tough times during the during the uh, depression. Uh, and they managed to keep the the company going, but my dad was basically off on his own um, <clears throat> from um, probably early teenage years on. He worked as a rancher in central Washington. He did get a couple of years of college, but it was just too much for him to work and go to school at the same time. So he hopped a freight, he became a hobo. And he crossed the country as a hobo. Uh, fortunately, a railroad detective picked him up, took him under his wing and, and took him to Chicago and got him a job there. <laughs> and then um, when the war started in 1939, when uh, Hitler went into Poland, uh, my dad says, well, sooner or later, we're gonna get into this. And uh, so he, joined the army in 1939 and he joined the army air corps and um, they shipped him to long island and he was an aerial photographer in those days and that's where he met my mom uh, if he hadn't joined the the army air corps he would have never met the mom my mom and i would not be here talking with you so um that's pretty that's pretty amazing have you ever thought what would it be like if dad had written his memoir you know from the whole, whole <laughs> it's uh there's something well, in your. Sorry, he, I, he had an extraordinary family, <laughs> and you know, and he used to tell me some of these stories. But he was always very shy about himself. Um, yeah, he didn't talk much about his own experiences. He would talk about family experiences, uh, people yeah. that he knew, but um, he was very private about himself. I, I'm very. I had to get over that same shyness. Um, let me adjust this camera yeah. here a little bit because I'm kind of camera's kind of falling down. What, what do you think made your dad shy? I think it was the environment growing up. Yeah. Um, and all the difficulties that he went through as a, as a youngster. Yeah. Um, and then also, of course, later on, he took on a lot of responsibility, running a business and so on and so forth. And while he was very close to his employees, uh, there still was always a barrier there. So I think he, and I think that one of the things that happens is as you grow older, your personality evolves. I won't say it changes, it evolves in, yeah. into a different mode. So for example, when he was young, I remember he was very garrulous. He liked to talk a lot, tell stories and things like that. As he, as he aged, he started becoming quieter and more introverted. And by the end of his life, he was a pretty introverted, pretty introverted character. Um, still very friendly and all the rest of that stuff, but there definitely yeah. was a change. <clears throat> yeah, let me let me riff on that with you because my brain is uh, going in different directions. I, I really just jump quadrants. That's how my brain's working. And I thought about this uh, introvert. I, I in my my practice, I do a, a training and development of business leaders, and my background's an executive. The you know this introversion thing was fascinating, so I, I started to to take a deep interest in psychology, and I found some in uh, some assessments uh, by Dr. Taylor Hartman that really looks at the motive or which is the why behind behavior, Chester, 
And my daughter's this profile, but in this uh, framework I use, your dad would have been what we call a, a white personality, which has the motive of peace. And a, a lot of what I started learning and using this in, in teaching is that, uh, you know, people who are shy, sometimes it's not shyness, but they have this peaceful motive. They, can we just all get along, you know, the world in harmony? And that appears to make them not quite extroverted. But what really it is, is that, it, they, you know, they'd rather have this harmony. But they're the kind, you know, in the profile of a white, the kindest people. And it uh, reminds me of my daughter, who's 24 in university now. I, I really miss her. She's across the country. Uh, I want to put something on screen again for you to help me out with uh, about your dad. Let me just add this to the screen. Uh, this was a beautiful piece out of the book that I, again, you're blessing me, Chester, and probably many children, because I think uh, I just want to say this to you, that I have a friend who's an educator in Ohio, university professor. He teaches uh, uh, grade I think the first year, and he said, half the kids in my classroom are broken. They're from maltreatment or homes that were underdeveloped with uh, a loving, caring uh, family. Just, I'm going to read this out to help you out, but this is out of the book, everybody. My father, all his life, was a kind man. He could be quite stern with me, but only when I got completely out of line. And always he treated me respectfully, though sometimes he had to fight to keep his temper in check. I'm just going to advance this. Uh, on my screen. Dad's respect was most clearly shown at the dinner table. Uh, let me just go back here and click a button. It was, it, as we'd sit and discuss the events of the day, he'd never evade any of my questions. He always treated my opinion as if they were coming from someone who was his equal, disregarding our age difference. This I remember from my early years after dinner, Dad and I would do the dishes. Read us the last uh, highlighted part there. We always love it when an author reads Okay. <laughs> I have to skirm around because the camera's kind of blocking it. No but, problem. Um, thereby um, taking some of the burden from my hard work working mother. Uh, you have to remember this is in the days before automatic dishwashers. You, you yeah. did this in the sink. <laughs> you know. uh, helping clean the house was another chore he gladly performed, although often exhausted himself. He helped uh, with the cleaning right up to the last days when he physically could no longer carry on. And still he complained about no longer being able to help. As soon as I saw, as he saw that I was up to it, he introduced me to progressively more dangerous but interesting tasks. At an early age, I learned how to safely use a full-size table saw and so on. That's So I'm going to bring us back together again here. And uh, I want to talk about that with you. But let me put on the screen another comment. Uh, on the screen, everyone, you can't see it if, when, if you're doing the audio, interesting background on introverts. Uh, so we, uh, we share a little bit of that. I, I want to just say to you as a, as a reader of your work, just how blessed you, your, that passage was. And I'd like to, when I give it back to you, I'd like to know what you think about this thought that I'll say from my own work as an author, that if somebody reads your book and there's one thing in it that connects to them, that helps change their life, it's a bestseller. And dude, I want to I want to say this honestly. When I read that, it's like I'm living vicariously through that passage in your parents, uh, almost saying, "I wish those were my parents," yeah. because I didn't know a life of that. For example, I married in a, as I said, an Italian, and we would go for dinners, and the boys would never get up off the table to clean the dishes. You know, that's the way it was. It was a girl's job, the, and whatnot. And yet, I was raised no sisters, and I today I do all the cooking and I clean, and my wife thinks it's just totally foreign to her. But what I wish is, is that in the early days of my development, I would see through my own eyes, my parents uh, loving each other like that. My father teaching me those those things that would not define me, but shape me later. Uh, my dad died in 2018. I'll just finish on this. And I was 22 years estranged from him. And then we reconnected. I thought he'd be there. And then he had a heart attack. And it was only later in life, Chester, that I started really, as you as you put it so well with your work, healing. And now I'm starting to see all the good that my dad did. And when I when I read that chapter in your book, I started thinking back and finding some of those good things that were actually in my parents' life up until I, the time I had blocked it out. So I just want to say thanks for that. I'm going to put uh, another photo up on the screen here. Let's have some fun. These photos are so cool. They're all in the book. This one here... Uh, 
What's going on there? It looks like some hippos. Oh, it's a really <laughs> funny story. So this is on the Elmo River, and we're drifting. The, the rafts that we had are ore-powered. They're, they're inflated rafts. And we had four of those uh, on this expedition. <clears throat> so we're drifting down the river, and there's a mama and a papa um, hippo, and there's a baby hippo. Yeah. And the baby hippo's in the water. And he, the baby hippo has never seen... And, you know, what the heck are these things drifting down through the river? And so the baby hippo was frightened and he ran up, he or she, whatever, the little critter ran up and hid behind mama and papa the hippo, waking them up. And they rushed down to the river. As you can see, one of them's just splashing into the river and they left baby hippo alone on the shore. <laughs> and, and, and we, yeah, we drifted by and watched this little drama taking place on the shore, and we just were howling with laughter after that. That's unfortunately, what, what, I didn't have my camera. Out sequence, <laughs> yeah, there's uh, these are nuggets. These black and whites in the book. Just uh, uh, I actually I had some fun with it in my mind. I'm thinking they're black and white, but the page words and then my imagination kind of filled in the color. And uh, again, in my work on brain science. Uh, you may may or may not know this, but only six percent of what we take in through through our eyes, uh, it's only six percent. The mind's eye, the other ninety four percent, is what perceives what that is. So here I am looking at hippos and reading your words on the page, and I'm having all these other stories going through my head, and I just was having a lot of fun with it. Let's uh, let's flip over to the Star Trek thing. I know I've purposely been kind of holding off on that. It's it's big time in the book front cover. What's that all about? Well, um, I was a graduate student uh, studying physics and, and, oh, well, actually I had switched from physics to engineering at that yeah. point. And um, um, my, I've had a friend that I had met, uh, we had worked together in some student politics. And well, actually we had worked as, a, as adversaries in student politics and became very good friends. Yeah. Um, and she wanted to write for Star Trek. And um there's a long story that's involved in how that happened, but um, sorry, that was Judy. I, right? I came up with an interesting idea and I suggested it to her, and she says, "Hey, let's collaborate." Mm. So we collaborated on a spec script, and through a variety of connections and good luck, uh, the script actually got read, and and it was uh, purchased by the Star Trek people. So uh, we were called up to uh, have a, a meeting with the producer and the story editor. <clears throat> and the consequence of that was, uh, we love like your story, but there have to be minor changes. Yeah. So the minor changes <laughs> involved completely rewriting the story. <laughs> and then to put pressure on us, they said, you've got to get it done by next Friday. We had a week to completely oh, of course. <laughs> start from scratch and write <laughs> a whole new story. We were able to save some of the elements of the original story, but uh, we got it done. You know, the last, uh, yeah. We literally worked all night. The yeah. last night typing the thing watched the sun come up got in the car and drove up to <laughs> <laughs> everybody we're here with the uh the author of the the book from from the potato to uh, beyond star trek hold it up again we want to sure. get you to hold that up for us i'm just going to put you back on the screen here i'm actually going to full screen you there we go yeah it's a very uh very cool co uh, cover it catches your attention and makes you wonder what it is thanks uh Thanks, Jester. We'll get that down again. Yeah, I was, you know, this whole, I think it was a season three, episode nine. So I got into this whole Star Trek piece and I was just like, all right, come on, really? You know, how often do you meet somebody who's actually reading? But one of the things that just blew my mind about your process, and again, I'm a writer author, is I, I can't remember the exact words in the book, but you just started doodling and writing notes. Uh, and I think it was Judy who was your sort of the lady involved in this whole whole episode of creating that and then when i read about changing the screenplay it brought back a thought i i, I may not have said this to too many of my show but uh when i was going through my brain injury i slipped into depression it was really tough to come back through that and i'm doing much better but i would have these crazy thoughts just to you know i'm gonna die i'm gonna die i gotta go do something in my life so i i I reached out and I registered to take a diploma program at the van uh, at uh, what's called In Focus Film School in Vancouver. I don't know if you know this, Chester, but no. the third biggest movie uh, pr production industry is in Canada. 
It's a Toronto. Well, actually, I do know something about that because my partner in the in the Star Trek thing, Judy Burns, yeah, was producer of a show that was was actually being filmed in Vancouver. Yeah, so I, exactly. I was aware that there was activity up there. Yeah, thank you. It's a multi billion industry, and in fact, if you if you have a production company here, you get the Canadian. Uh, tax credits on labor 25 percent discount and of course our dollar is 40 cents your 40 cent premium so uh, it's hollywood north and we have all seasons yeah. here so where's i going with this just try to get my thoughts my my brain is 25 percent latent so i tend to string my thoughts and they disappear so just bear with me uh and so the the uh this the the, the, the yeah so the infield focus film school i'll finish with this I attended a free webinar once they got me signed up. I never did complete the diploma because of my injury. Uh, it's on my list to do next year. And uh, it was about screenplay writing. And I didn't know that, but they had people come on who had done some of these sitcoms saying that they would create these screenplays and then the writers would get a hold of it. And by the time it was done, it was nothing like what he had written. And there was this big debate going on uh, in the chat room from the students saying, why, why would we even want to be a writer? If we're going to write something and it changes to be not even our thoughts and the fellow who is teaching he is a very well-known uh, screenwriter uh, talked about the passion and why you know how how these things are shaped and they become a legacy and you started it with with a seed in your thoughts so it, it came full circle to me like you know what I'd love to be a screenplay writer the um, uh, the thing I wanted to ask you about was is the Thelonian web who came up with that whole was that your whole like, the, the, well <laughs> i think it was my idea i'm not sure what's a tholonian uh, <laughs> it, well, just... it was and, oh, tholian. and and there's a there's a description as to where i got that name it came from a, a scientist friend that i that i knew ah. was an archaeologist um uh, that happened when Judy and I were sitting on the beach trying to fork a new story up. <laughs> and, we, and, and, you know, we were, we were trying to, to uh, uh, put more jeopardy in the, in the story. And yeah. uh, so we had come up with the Tholians, you know, as, as bad guys that, that we knew, but then we had to do something to make it even more spectacular. So yeah. Somewhere along the line, we came up with this idea of a big fishnet to, to reel the <laughs> enterprise. And, and then uh, um, wonderful special effects guy, Mike Miner, actually created the, the visuals on the web. And that, that is a, what he did was a masterpiece of stop action animation. Absolutely. I, I you know, so everybody, I'm not going to, again, spoil the, 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 the story. But this is what it did to me. As soon as I've read that, I read it again because uh, I'm a big Shatner fan anyway because he's Canadian. And I don't know if I mentioned to you, but when my book was published, I was able to get on his Moving America Forward TV show and, and do something in Hollywood about my story, taking my adversity and using it to teach. And uh, I started, I literally got to put your book down and I went on the internet and I started Googling Tholian web, Tholian web. I went to every Star Trek website. I even went to the Smithsonian, and I won't steal the thunder about that one. It's going like, okay, I gotta, I gotta go find that thing that he talked about, and I came up with all these pictures and things, and even little clips from IMDb, the movie uh, place where they post stuff about Tholian web, and I'd never seen that episode, and yet growing up, I I saw a lot of them. So, I uh, I just want to say this, everyone, that you got to get the book and read it because. How many of us will ever meet somebody who comes up with the seed of thought and writes a screenplay and it becomes an episode for something like that? Hey, listen, we're, we're, uh, we're going to keep going for a little bit more, but I have a couple more things I've written down here sure. uh, as a research. Uh, they called you retarded in, in school. Tell us about that. There's a bit in the book because as a scientist and a guy who's I'm talking to, and I know that story evolves, but what was that all about? Well, I was in first grade, and I had a first grade teacher that that uh, I think she was through the goodness of her heart. She was trying to big, bring the slowest of the kids in the class up to some kind of a standard, mm -hmm. but she per completely ignored the bright kids in the class. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, I was one of the bright kids, and we just talked. <laughs> and yeah, we talked, and we <laughs> talked, and we talked, 
And she came to the conclusion that I was mentally retarded because I talked all the time. <laughs> uh, that's great. Uh, my, stra- my mom straightened the teacher out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember reading that. I, I won't, again, I won't share it, but your mother was amazing. But there's something about you, and I think it's another time to honor you for who you are. It's something about your resilience, but this positivity that comes from you. Even uh, knowing, reading the first chapter of the book about Sarah's passing and all that, uh, there's this, this, I think one of the biggest gifts in the book is this persistence. And I know when I read that about the school thing and how you came through, and you proved later that you were actually quite gifted. I think I read somewhere that you, uh, you were in fourth grade or you were somewhere and you were already reading at a level of here. Oh, yeah. Um, well, Within the first six weeks in second grade, we, I was reading at the fourth grade level. Yeah. And, and by the time I finished uh, second grade, I was reading at the high school level. Wow. And, high school. And, 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 and by the time I got to third grade, I was reading at the college level. So That's amazing. And especially being a, sci- a scientist in that, in that uh, area. Uh, but what I thought about when I read that is the gift in that part of the story to me is all the, all the people who read that and say, that's my story except theirs didn't always turn out like yours. It kind of gives courage. It gives the uh, courage to say, I'm, it's okay to say I'm not okay, or it's it's okay to talk about this teacher. Uh, there's so many people I've met through my work that tell me they had a dream or they had an idea. I, For example, a president that I know runs a local company, he said he wanted to paint, uh, you know? And he, I said, why didn't you? He said, because he had a teacher who said, don't ever, give it up, you'll never be creative. And those thoughts in our brains up until when we have the frontal lobe, the ability to rationalize, they basically get wired in and sets our circuitry. And yeah, let, so, me, let me make a comment about that. There is a um, special relationship between a teacher and a student yeah. because the teacher controls the student's future. And if you get a teacher that, that turns the student off, that damage can be enormous. And there is a story in, in there about an experience that I had that really... Uh, yeah. Uh, Short circuited one of one of the abilities that I had. Yeah. Well, thank you for for sharing that. And that's where I was going with this is that, again, everyone, yet another thread in, in the book about this uh, this thing. What's interesting is I didn't have that from teachers. I had it from three or four people in my family, my my father, my mother and my my uh, one of my brothers. And, uh, you know, far from being called stupid and fat, uh, I was getting A's in school. My my older brother was getting C's, and he had to work really hard. And yet, and yet, those words that were were said were they literally wired me. So even when I became a uh, at an early age, I went into business and became a, a CEO at age thirty one. It was very young for me. And anytime I did something well, looking in the mirror, what was coming back to me was just uh, the inability to believe that I was that this was really happening. Is that internal wire voice? which comes from those words that weren't true. So very, very powerful. Thank you for writing about that. Uh, one more thing I want to put on the screen here as we're heading near the end. I'll just flip that. There was a rocket there. There was that. Yeah, tell us about this and who, where are you in that picture? I'm, I'm out of, almost out of the picture on the far left of the, <laughs> holding a clarinet. And uh, this was a, a recital graduation picture. Uh, uh, at Charles Music Studio, where I was learning how to play uh, yeah. woodwinds of various kinds, uh, and I, you know, I can even remember the names of several of the people in there, which is interesting because <laughs> this is, you know, gosh, how old was I? <laughs> Pretty young. Um, uh, even the dress, I get fascinated because I'm visual, but the the dating of these pictures and the dress code and all was just like, yeah, uh, well, it was a different age. There's no question about it. the The world had a different feel to it than it has today. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I think I got one more picture here. Let's well, use this. Obviously mom and dad. Yeah. Uh, so again, 60 years together, right? Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Who do you look more like? <laughs> who do you uh, think? Who do you think you look more like? I think I look more like my dad. Yeah. Uh, but well, I'm I'm a mongrel. I'm a, I'm a member of the great American mongrel family. I've got <laughs> Inputs from all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Truly, uh, truly amazing. I do see a little uh, Sicilian in that, and this one caught my heart too. Who's who's that? Uh... Okay. Well, I'm obviously the kid on the left, and yeah, 
uh, my dad and he's holding my kid sister, uh, Joan Marie. Yeah. And she is two years old in this picture, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so she's 15 years younger than I am. Yeah. And, uh, she's had an extraordinary career on her own <clears throat> working as a diplomat with the U S foreign service. Where, where does she live uh, close to you or is she still around? No, she's, she's living in Virginia and rest in Virginia. Yeah. And she's retired from the state department now. And she's gone back to her, what's now a hobby, but it's, it started out being a profession. She has a, a, a PhD in medieval history. So she's doing a lot of work in, in translating med medieval documents, old French and old English. Wow. Amazing. Modern. Pictures, pictures say a thousand words. The, uh, you're pretty tall there. What a good looking dude. I mean, come on. What's with well, the hair? I didn't think I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you and I share I that. I can look back on myself and sort of look okay. But you yeah. know, when you're in the middle of that body, it doesn't, doesn't seem <laughs> to be <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I just love the cardigan because we used, my mom used to dress us that way and of course I had a big full head of jet black hair and then uh, not quite now this one is the last one I'll put up and this one kind of just stopped me it's one of those pictures like uh, as as I've learned the brain is well, a prediction yeah, that's machine. Laura May she was my other mother yeah and uh, she was my mammy um, because mom was working as a public health nurse which means that mom was in the in the countryside wandering around with her car in the backwoods of Georgia. Uh, somebody had to take care of me. So uh, I got Laura May to take care of me. And wow. uh, as far as I could tell, I was lucky because I had two mothers. Yeah. And Laura May was one of my mothers. And I played with, she was, uh, mom told me that she was about 17 or 18 years old. Really? And she had little brothers and sisters. So she would take me over to her mother's house. Yeah. And I would just play with her brothers and sisters. Those were my kid, my uh, my friends from that period. Uh, I, I read something about Aunt Jemima. I'm not sure where that thought <laughs> well, came from. <laughs> if, if you remember in the old days, they had on the hot cake and the box of, of hot cake mix, yeah. they had a picture of a, a colored lady I do. Uh, named Aunt Jemima. And I always used to think that, that Laura May was... <laughs> on the cover of the pancake mix box. <laughs> what, Mom what? kept saying, no, no, that's not Laura. And I said, no, this is. <laughs> But, you, you know, see, what does a three-year-old know? <laughs> of course. See, you did it to me again, man, because my brain again trips up. I, I looked at that and I read that and I thought it was true. So I went and Googled Edge of My Impact. I was trying to compare the picture going like, wow, this guy met her. Oh, my goodness. How did he... <laughs> But isn't there something lovely about that picture? You've got a a, a a dark woman and a Caucasian boy. There's just something innocent in a world where everybody, I mean, in Canada, we're all Canadians, but in some parts of the world, we're labeled. I grew up being called Hindu raghead. I had a very tough part of my life where there was no melting pot. I just think it's a, a an amazing picture. Well, it's an interesting experience because I didn't see color. Wow. Only, only in modern times when people keep talking about color, yeah. do I even see it? Um, but to me, I, you know, these were people that I know, knew and loved. Yeah. You and were you, and your parents must have been wired that way too, right? Just uh, must have been. Well, mom was a WAP. Yeah. <laughs> she was a Sicilian. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But because because I, I some I I I'm thinking of doing a, my second TED talk one day, maybe in the U.S. Because I'd love to get to Seattle, and. Uh, my speaking coach said, what would your topic be? And I'm just saying it as I think it. I said, you know, uh, racism is a, racism doesn't exist. It's a state of mind. And so when, when I was born, like you, we didn't, we have, I think we have as adults, uh, 87 billion neurons or brain cells. Those brain cells house thoughts and emotions and things. But they're, they're kind of not filled with anything when we come into the world. So where does the word racism comes from? Where does this whole thing about color and whatnot, and it's self-perpetuating. There's an well, I off- think, I think it's also wired into us to some extent because we're tribal yeah. by, by nature. Interesting. And, you know, uh, tribes that are alien are potentially dangerous. You have friendly tribes and you have potentially dangerous tribes. And so I think we have a certain self-protective mechanism that's wired into our brain. And yeah. we generalize from that basic uh, biology. And That's sometimes amazing. we overgeneralize, I think. It's amazing. I uh, Now it's time to have a little fun with you because we're going to uh, reveal your review for your book. 
you wanted to know if I liked it. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Yeah, you, you did me the great honor of actually reading it. So. Hey, nobody, nobody, listen, the amount of work people have to do to come on my show, because the narrative is I don't want to hear just all the bragging. I want to hear the gut punches, the development of the human mind and how it shaped you. Uh, I absolutely read, read cover to cover. Uh, I think there's no way I can have you on my show if you're showing up authentic. So I'm going to just turn to my left here. You see on my screen behind me, there's a bunch of pictures. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, apologies, I couldn't get this on the screen fast enough. Now, I'm going to make a custom uh, piece for you that's going to have picture your book. When this is posted on Amazon, they'll usually confirm. And I'm going to send that to you so you can use it for marketing. But I'm going to... Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I'm just going to read it. It was posted today. And so it's uh, right on the Kindle version, and it's uh, it's five star. And the t t title I called it "Wisdom of Space and Time." And I, I, somebody said to me a long time ago, "The difference between knowledge and wisdom is time." And you are a man of wisdom, and I can see through this book. Author Richard's memoir is classic storytelling through the e through the eras. I like the black and white photos of iconic moments, colored by the words in my imagination. I wanted to know the author beyond his external stories, and he delivered his inner fears and triumphs, quenching my curiosities about his life motives. I recommend this book. So congratulations. Oh, thank you. That's on your, And uh, put up a <laughs> little fireworks for you. That's, that's not an exploding rocket, by the way, you scientists guys. Uh, this, by the way, that's posted on Amazon.ca, which is your is an international review. So I'm excited. Yeah. Uh, in the piece I'm going to build for you, I'll put the Canadian flag, the American flag, uh, so that that'll be notable. Let's um, let's move to the last piece, which is where I honor you with an award. I don't know if I told you you'd be getting an award. Did you know that? No, I had no idea. Okay, uh, these are hard to get. So let me just put uh, full screen me for a minute. Pardon me for doing this. All right, so Chester, do you see on the screen there, there's sort of a round shape? Yeah, it says a quiet, war quiet Warrior Show. Correct. Now, these that, that is a, an image, a real image of a challenge coin. Have you heard of these? Yes. Uh, created in World War II, soldiers carried them to commit community. They were rewarded with them. Today, they're used all over the world, actually, for community. Uh, first responders. My dad was in Alcoholics Anonymous, 22 years. They had their version. When I started the show, I wanted to develop an award. Didn't know how this show would go. I just said, I want to hear people come on and start telling the truth about what it takes to get to be in service in your life. The front of it is, uh, these are hand-painted and, and crafted in the U.S., raised lettering. The front is the show image. The back is actually the, a beautiful illustration of the Hero's Journey narrative by Joseph Campbell, which is really the foundation of my show. So you're going to get this. I'll be sending it to you. I'll have to get your address. Thank you. Uh, we have about uh, 40 or so a year going out, and they're now carried in the pockets of people in 17 countries. And when you look at the show archives, you'll see some of the incredible people have been on this show. You're now part of that uh, tribe, so to speak. So welcome yep. aboard. <laughs> and finally, my four words to honor you before we wrap up. Uh, these are words that, I write, they're not scripted as you're speaking. Uh, one is love, uh, you, you know, you're a, a man of uh, uh, many words, but it comes out of you in your writing. And especially when I you talk about your parents, I see your eyes welling up and this, uh, this love that comes out of you. So thank you. One is, uh, number two is Trailblazer. Reading the book, we'll see all the things you've done in your life. It's like, man, did you ever look back and go, that that was my life? I mean, yeah, dude. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's interesting. I've had, yeah, I, I guess the best way to ex explain it is I'm a pinball in a pinball machine. <laughs> <laughs> and I get bounced around from one place to another. You never know where you're going to go next. Uh, uh, yeah. But I've I had a lot of interesting experiences. Uh, and thank you for sharing them. The third word is uh, authority. The, the word author, authority. Uh, you're an authority on uh, many, many topics. And that's why this book is an education book as well. And then the last one I meant it already is uh perseverance uh you got it from you, you were you you were born with it you were shaped with it however it came what you've demonstrated to all of us in your book is the power of perseverance and and hope and uh i think the biggest thing i've learned also as an advocate for mental 
health is when we can drop everything and do what we love to do, go on an adventure, explore, uh, releasing dopamine and all these great uh, things that make us feel better and happier. Uh, your book is a real adventure and worth getting. So I'll uh, give it to you for the uh, last word before we move to wrap up. Anything you want to tell anybody where to get a hold of the book? Hold it up again. Uh, yeah. Um, the book is available on Amazon, of course, and um, um, Barnes & Noble as well. And I guess Walmart, ha uh, you can get it through Walmart as well. Um, and I have a website, chesterlrichards.com. There's all kinds of interesting stuff on the website. Uh, I have a Twitter site that's also connected through that. And um, um, I just hope that people uh, who do read this, who get a chance to read it, will enjoy it and uh, share some of the adventures that I've had the great privilege of living through. I mean, um, it's I've... I've just done some interesting things and I've met some extraordinary people along the way. And I've had the opportunity to, uh, to bring back alive some of those people who are gone and share them with the rest of the world, share my experience of, of the, the pleasure of, of having known these people and, and uh, telling some of their stories as well. Well, for your first published book, uh, amazing work. And thanks for being here. Uh, definitely going to be staying uh, connected to you for life and we'll have you back again to share more stories so everybody uh, find that true passion like you hear from chester l richards and live that life that you deserve and desire and hey chester thanks again it was an awesome talk with you today oh thanks uh, it's been a pleasure it really has all right Thank you for listening to The Quiet Warrior Show. Create is a motive-based leadership development firm. www.kreat.ca